Okay guys, we're going to take a side note here and talk about Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. It's where I left off the other day. I'm going to start off with Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton is sometimes referred to as the father of the national jet. He was a native of the British West Indies and some doubted his loyalty to the American cause or the Republican experiment. His area of, of expertise is going to be economics and finance, and he is going to do everything in his power to create a government and an economic program that he feels is most beneficial for the nation. Um, and he is going to have some strong opposition, and his strong opposition is mainly going to come from Thomas Jefferson. Now, Hamilton's ideas, he sought to transform the American people into free, opulent, and law-abiding citizens through the instrumentality of a limited Republican government on the basis of consent and in the face of powerful vested interests in the status quo. Now, I don't think that statement necessarily sounds like someone who is desiring to go against the federal government. He does want um, a limited government. He does want a representation of the people. He does want a government based on consent. But he is desiring a much larger government. Um, Hamilton is a guy who has a very low opinion of the average citizen. He really feels like government is going to need to be there to help take care of people. It's a, a very strange mix of ideas from our modern day idea of Republican, Democrat, and modern political parties. Um, he's almost a mix, and I think you'll see that in a lot that we read. Um, also, ideas of Hamilton, he is considering this whole American experiment as being a social revolution. And, um, you know, to a degree, maybe he's right. Uh, you have a group of people who are starting to stand up against their government and uh, they're starting to take a more active role in society and not simply waiting for someone to make the decision for them. Um, and in doing that, there's a lot of um, industriousness, that reward industriousness. Um, that's something that's going to be absolutely necessary for this new government to work is a citizenry that is willing for it to work. Um, there's a strive for money to define value and standing and be the universal measure. Um, so this is going to be a movement into using money, using money to define value of a product and to use money as a universal measure of wealth. That's a new concept during this time period. Uh, rewarding industriousness, how do you reward industriousness? Wealth. Uh, he believed free government preferable to monarchy because it excited people more. Interested passions of the community leading to the public spirit and public confidence. This free government gave citizens a more, uh, more of an opportunity to take an active role in their success. Um, so it is going to be more exciting. Whereas a monarchy has a lot more control and... Um, you know, there's, there's a fear of this time, at this time period of a strong monarchy. Now, the goals of Hamilton. He wants to correct the economic failings of the Articles of Confederation by shaping fiscal policies to favor wealthier groups. Yes, Hamilton was an elitist. He wants to shape economic policy to favor those groups. His idea, the hope that these groups would lend the government money, Okay. Support, which would then in turn lead to a thriving new government, increasing land owner wealth, and creating a trickle-down effect. Yes, um, I believe this is um, bad words during this time period, trickle-down economics. Um, we'll talk a lot more about that as we get into modern economic policy. Um, but this during this time period wasn't such a bad word. He hoped these groups would become more and more involved in the government and in hopes that they would put their economic wealth into the hands of government in hopes that it would grow that government and everyone would benefit. He encouraged the federal government to fund the national debt He um, and uh, assumed the debts of the states in hopes that it would be the tie to the states to the federal government 
he really thought that if the federal government would assume state debts, states would then be indebted to and tied to economically to the federal government. And states tied to the economic um, success of the federal government would have a compelling interest in that national success. Remember, we go from a collection of colonies to this confederation of convenience, and there's still a lot of division. So according to Hamilton, if you can get them to put their money up, then maybe they would have a, an economic interest in this national success, in this government working, in this country working. Now, he believed debt would be a cohesive element for wealthy society in the national government. Hey, if I loan you money, I have a stake in your success. I want you to be successful because I want my money back. Operating money for the government was to come from customs duties or tariffs, which were um, dependent upon foreign trade. So not only building up the domestic security of the nation, but also building up the foreign involvement of the nation. Hamilton was a proponent of industrialism, and he hoped that if the Industrial Revolution would hit America, which America was still predominantly agricultural, He's going to come in great conflict with Thomas Jefferson over this particular issue. Hamilton's a guy who wanted to make it. He wanted to be successful, and his idea of success was tied to investment, tied to business, foreign and domestic, and tied to jumping on the next big thing. And in this time period, the next big thing is an industrial revolution. Now, what else is Hamilton known for? National Bank. It would be modeled after the Bank of England. Hamilton is going to propose a private institution with the national government as the major stockholder. Jefferson just about lost his mind over this one because he did not feel that a national bank was authorized by the Constitution. Jefferson was a supporter of strict interpretation, whereas Hamilton was not. I describe Hamilton like a teenager. Um, if you don't say I can't do it, then I can. You know, he, he found the loopholes. Hamilton, loose interpretation. He's using implied powers, necessary and proper. The government can do what is necessary and proper for its success. Jefferson completely disagrees with this concept. Funny thing about Jefferson and the necessary proper clause and implied powers, it comes to benefit him later. Now, who was more successful at manipulating the machinery of government to shape American society? Alexander Hamilton or Thomas Jefferson? Why? Think about it. If you need more information, go to this website right here, teachinghistory.org slash history dash content slash ask dash a dash historian slash 24094. I would read it to you again, but I don't want to. It's right here. Feel free. Um, or simply Google Hamilton versus Jefferson. One or the other should get you where you want to go, but this is definitely worth reading about because these two guys create a lot of tension during this time period and lay the foundation for decisions that would come much later. Now, Hamilton, Federalist, Treasury Secretary. He had an agreement um, of Washington with regard to broadening the economy, strengthening the national government for the purpose of national growth. And Hamilton wanted to do all of this stuff through economic adventure. He was concerned with the development of material resources to make the nation self-sufficient. Here's a concept, self-sufficient nation. Hamilton wanted to get involved in international affairs, international trade, but he did want resources. He did want the nation to be self-sufficient. Now, Hamilton does tend to favor Great Britain in foreign affairs. Again, very different from Jefferson. Hamilton presses for larger regular army as a means of expanding the power of the national government. He's justifying this need because of conflict with Native Americans. Um, and also, this regular army is going to say, don't mess with us. We just beat the most powerful nation in the world. Don't take us on. Um, Hamilton is an implied powers proponent. He believed that the government could do what was necessary and proper. And he also believed corruption of government is what makes it work. Let me explain that for a second. Corruption of government... Um, the government has a lot of deal-making in it, and some feel that it's corrupt. Maybe it is, 
But let's face it, if we can make a deal, we can make things work, we can get things done. And Hamilton believes that's how you got things done. Hamilton desired a commercial society, not an agrarian society. Agrarian means farming. And America, as it was, early America, and even some areas of America today, are agrarian. They are agricultural based. Um, Hamilton is going to push for the Alien and Sedition Acts. And uh, there is fear of individuals, foreigners, in, within the borders at this point in time, even then. Um, during the era of good feelings, we'll talk more about that, his ideas begin to take hold. America does develop a military, there is internal improvement, and we do charter a national bank a couple of times. Now, Jefferson, Jeffersonian Republican here. Jeffersonian, is uh, he gets his own era. He is Secretary of State, very cautious about enhancing the power of the federal government. He's going to favor that human farmer. Okay, Jefferson is an agriculturalist. He believes that we need to stick to those agrarian um, policies of the United States or agrarian policies of this early uh, government. Jefferson's going to sympathize with the French and believe that America's um, international success would be dependent upon a French alliance. Besides, the French helped us in this American Revolution. We owe them. Policies contributing to that of... Uh, continued that of Washington with westward expansion. Um, now, the irony with Jefferson is the Louisiana Purchase. I'll spend some time hovering on this later, but Jefferson, who was dedicated to strict interpretation of the presidential powers, seized the opportunity when he got to double the size of the United States with the purchase of Louisiana. Funny thing, wasn't a presidential power to make that purpose, but purchase, but he uh, did so using the necessary and proper clause. He was a strict interpretationist, believing in the explicit powers of the Constitution. If the Constitution does not say you can do it, then you can't. Now, this Jeffersonian Republicanism is based upon self-sufficiency. I'm going to argue that Jefferson and Hamilton aren't too far off on this point. Okay, Jefferson's self-sufficiency, if everyone is independent, they are likely to behave in a manner that will sustain the uh, Republic. Looking back at uh, Hamilton here, Hamilton is, is concerned with the, the benefit of society, believing that individuals um, are out for success, believing that you can strengthen the government through industriousness and being industrious and working hard. I don't think that's too far off from self-sufficiency. Now, if everyone is independent, they are likely to behave in a manner that will sustain the republic. Think about that statement and let me know what you think. Now, the winner in all of this, Alexander Hamilton, father of the national debt. America is going to develop a national bank, develops on credit, establishes a standing army. The United States, even today, allies with Britain. And uh, some will argue that we even continue on a path of governmental corruption. I don't know. You're welcome to argue that if you want. That's, uh, that's a debate for a different day. Now, ultimately, Hamilton was more convincing, and Washington is going to allow the bank. The United States was eventually extended credit by the Netherlands, and the credit debt begins. Welcome to America. We start out in debt. Although some consider Hamilton successful, others are going to believe his uh, physical policies create an infringement on states' rights. You decide. Opposition begins to develop, political parties are in the works, people are taking sides. Hamilton's on one side as a Federalist, and uh, you have Jefferson on the other side. These two guys are going to come head to head and disagree extremely much, much to the point where Jefferson's actually going to resign his position. Now, back to this great experiment. The question was what to do with the debt during the war. Remember, Hamilton thought debt was a good unifying element for the country. Well, debt certainly makes you work harder, I guess. Nothing like collectors knocking on the door to strengthen the household. In this case, consider the collector's family because everyone has a compelling interest in seeing that this new government works. Individuals who had loaned the money, countries who had loaned the money, there's great hope that America is going to work. Now, the other issue, um, what to do with the army? 
They wanted to get paid for their service, and they are not happy with the situation. Now, Robert Morris is going to step in.